Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast. My name is Jill Foos. I'm a functional medicine and integrative nutrition health coach. I created this podcast to bring you along as we travel down intriguing science-packed roads, debunking old medical paradigms and perusing new innovative therapies and modalities with the finest functional medicine doctors, practitioners, and like-minded biohackers while living our best life. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Health Trip Podcast, Jeff. I am so excited to have you on today as my guest and to dig a little deep on cattle ranching with you. So thank you so much for joining me today. Of course, thanks for having me. Before we dig deep, I want to give my listeners a little history about you. So Jeff Smith is an Oregon native and agricultural industry industry veteran that married into the ranching industry. He is a 2005 graduate of Colorado State University with a bachelor's degree in agricultural business with minors in finance and accounting. He has worked across multiple sectors of agriculture to include cattle, horses, chicken, hogs, seed, grain, flour, brewing, transportation, and many others in roles ranging from operations and sales to executive level business management. He and his wife, Kara, own and operate Colorado Craft Beef, a direct-to-consumer beef business that is centered around Kara's family's five-generation ranch that was homesteaded by her great-great-grandfather in 1913. Together, Jeff and Kara combine their knowledge and expertise to provide the highest quality beef to a national audience with cattle that are raised by them personally and shipped from the family ranch every Monday. So we're going to cover a lot of great topics today, including raising cattle, regenerative and sustainable farming practices, producing high-quality grain and grass-fed and finished beef, and what the future of America's beef production looks like. So this is going to be a great conversation. And as a fellow carnivore, this could not be a more perfect podcast for me personally. So I want to know more about your history of your family's ranch. I know you married into this ranch, but there's got to be some great story behind the scenes. Well, it's, uh, it's really humbling to be on here and to be a spokesperson for the family. So thanks again for having me today. Uh, So as it said in the bio, the family originally settled this piece of real estate in 1913. Uh, They got the double slash N brand, which is legally registered to the state of Colorado in 1917. Uh, And the original headquarters for the ranch is about a quarter mile from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, And believe it or not, the house that was built on that original piece of ground is was moved into town in the 50s and still stands today. Uh, A very, very storied history out here. Uh, there's survey monuments on the ranch that, you know, the old brass cap survey monuments that are from 1912. Um, just some crazy stuff. Uh, or occasionally you'll find arrowheads out here. Uh, just a very storied piece of piece of earth. You know, the Comanches lived out here. And I, I would love to know and have seen it, you know, two or 300 years ago. Uh, but that being said, I don't think it probably looks a whole lot different than it does now. Uh, we've got you know, a few thousand acres under family control here. Uh, There's no farming done on this property. Uh, Believe it or not, we have a hay sickle, that old old horse-drawn hay sickle sitting in front of our house, Uh, an old John Deere that would have been built, gosh, in the 20s or 30s probably. And when we uh, bought our place up here from the neighbors, we put a little uh, monument out front and put a pile of rocks out there and moved that hay sickle from my father-in-law's place to ours. And I asked the story, I said, you know, the haysickle was overblown with dirt. I had to move a bunch of dirt and pick it up with an excavator to get it out of the weeds. And my father-in-law's comment was, just know that thing never leaves the ranch because it's an antique, of course. But he said that his grandfather parked that haysickle the last time the horses ran off with him, which would have been before my father or my grand, or excuse me, my father-in-law remembers. And he was born in 56. Wow. So that thing sat in the same area for 50 years because yeah. farming this piece of real estate wasn't feasible. Uh, so it's interesting when I've had people ask me at different events, whether they be, you know, in big cities or at agricultural type events about sustainability, kind of to dovetail into all the stuff we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. I've taken a lot of classes. I know a lot of really smart people that are way smarter than I am about agriculture and anything in between. But I actually asked somebody one day, I said, do you really think 
that my wife's family in a hundred years in this piece of the world haven't figured out the best way to do it. You know, is there a class that's going to tell you more than a hundred years of tradition will tell you. <clears throat> um, so when people ask us, you know, you should farm, you should this, I'm like, and the family tried that decades ago. Uh, it just won't work. So when we tie into a lot of the sustainability conversations, uh, we're going to circle back to that because there's nobody that knows this piece of ground better than my wife's family. And that same story carries across family ranches and family farms in states and nations across the world that are very, very regionally centric. And that's the one thing with mm -hmm. ag we have to be very careful of. Um, you know, people where you're at in Chicago, um, not Chicago specifically, but Illinois, farm mm -hmm. differently than people do here based on soil type, things of that nature. So right. I'll apologize early if I seem ambiguous on some of the answers, mm -hmm. but sometimes the answers are best found by the people at the place we're asking the question. That's a great point. So when you say farming, so ranching is livestock and farming is ag, is that correct? Farming is crops. So farming is corn, soybeans, right. nuts, things of that nature. Ranching okay. is livestock operations. Got it, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. So I read on your website that you still work on horses. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just so cool. I, I'm a, a fellow horseback rider. I grew up at a barn and um, to me, horses are just the greatest. And being able to ride a horse as part of my work day, wow. Like it couldn't get any better than that, right? But, right. and you mentioned that you do that to mitigate more stress on the animals which mm. is so mindful and thoughtful because, you know, many people have no connection with a rancher or a farmer and we just go to the grocery store and buy the products and come home and we don't, there's a lot of people out there who just don't put much thought into how it even got there. Mm. So I love that you're thinking about the stress on the animals, but how, what does that mean to the life of the cattle and the end product, meaning the, the taste of, of the meat. Mm -hmm. So there, there's kind of a few different layers of the onion to peel back there. Um, for us, um, the double slash in range, the majority of what the family ranch does here is in the yearling slash stalker operator sector, uh, which you heard me talk about, I believe on carnivore cast. Yeah. So those for ease of understanding are kind of like the teenagers of the cattle world. They're, they're in a big group. They may not make the best decisions at times. And if you get out there with a four-wheeler or a pickup and you're trying to move them with that foreign device, they just don't, don't respond well. Now, the flip side of that, because mind you, these, these yearling calves have been on this property one time and then they leave. Now, if you take a mother cow operation that raises cow calves in the same circular rotation of, of pasture, Every year they go from this pasture to that pasture, and then they go back to the home place to calve, and then they go out to the calving pasture. Those mother cows are there for eight years. They learn the rotation. You open the gate, you drive behind them with a the pickup, they know it's time to go. Um, so it's a lot about the different mental space those cattle are in at the different time of their life, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, we go out and we can ride through them on horseback. Now you're four-legged you're a little taller, they don't really mind. And a lot of times they'll actually walk up and wonder what you're doing. They get used to that where, you know, if you think about, you know, what are, what are cattle in the wild? They're a prey animal. It's a fight or flight instinct. Do you walk up on two legs looking way different than them? They're probably not gonna wanna be around you. Mm. Now, when it comes to doing work inside pens when we've brought them in from pasture and we're sorting or something like that, some of that is done on foot. Um, that's done in a very calm uh, BQA, actually beef quality assurance. There's a national certification for that, mm. where you learn to do low stress cattle handling, things of that nature. Uh, and that's very common in the industry. There's a lot of people that do that. So, you know, what we do isn't unique to us. Uh, it works best for our operation um, and how we operate. But, you know, low stress cattle handling is a big thing across the industry, whether you're a cow calf operator or even all the way to the harvest facilities. Um, because believe it or not, us having less stress on cattle at the ranch is good just for a quality of life for them. 
they break less things, <laughs> they run through less fences, they cause less damage. But from a meat quality standpoint, you're probably not going to see that, especially if it's you know five or six months later that they're going to go to harvest. What you'll actually see more so than anything is an economic impact, because if you stress those cattle when they're on grass, they're not going to eat for a couple of days, they're probably going to lose some weight. And mm. economically, you have less resource to sell. Um, mm. That's, of course, very hard to quantify. But from a meat science standpoint, kind of a non-issue. However, when you go to a harvest facility uh, and cattle are harvested for meat, if you stress them out too much, they can produce more lactic acid. They can do, they do all the same a million things that we do. Mm -hmm. um, you stress yourself, your heart rate goes up, you maybe pump more blood in your muscles because you're trying to have that fight or flight response. Uh, and you can actually get a thing called a dark cutter carcass, which is basically too much blood in the, in the muscular system because they were pumped up and stressed out. So they were trying to have that fight or flight response. Um, so that's where it's most critical for meat quality. Um, so anywhere that's USDA inspected, which anything anybody is buying retail or at the store or from someone like myself, um, anything that's USDA inspected, that'll be pulled out. That's not sellable product. Um, but, you know, all the way through the system, whether you're at the harvest facility or cow-calf operator, nobody is trying to stress the animals out. I mean, you can imagine even if you're working with a 300-pound calf, that weighs more than I do. If they're a little more malleable and you're not being as aggressive and you're being softer with them and they respond mm -hmm. to that, you have a lot lower propensity to get injured. They have a lot lower propensity to get injured because injured cattle are no good. Right. Um, so it's, there is something to be said for the taste of the steak. There is some semblance of that coming in, but a bigger part of it is just being a good steward of the animal, yeah. which all of us are trying to do. Yeah, I love hearing that. So you said that your ranch in particular deals with yearlings. So mm -hmm. then does that mean they're born somewhere else? And right. then you purchase those? Do you own the, the mamas? Nope. So there's three distinct sectors in the cattle industry. Mm -hmm. You have the cow calf operators, mm -hmm. you have the stalker slash yearling operators, and then you have the feed yards. Um, some of those can be combined. There's some operations that have all of those. Mm -hmm. There's some operations that have all of those and their own harvest facility. Mm -hmm. um, so it just kind of depends. Um, the, but the typical segments in the cattle industry are cow calf operators, mm -hmm. yearling operators, feeders, and then harvest facilities. So what we at Colorado Craft Beef do and the family as a whole in the commercial sector, mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, we don't farm. Um, Farming ground is actually really important for cow calf operators because their cows live on the farm ground all winter. Right. It's somewhere you can feed them. Uh, the manure is then natural fertilizer. Mm -hmm. That's an asset we don't have. Uh, where we ranch, it's actually sugar sand. So our ground here is like the same consistency as beach sand. Oh. So if we had mother cows here all winter, we would just wipe out all the vegetation. So just from a sustainability standpoint, we can't have cattle like that at that time of year. Um, so that's what the family has done as they've went that direction. Uh, we buy calves from the mother, or from the, excuse me, the mother cow operations. And then we wean them, we make sure they're healthy. We get them squared away and then they go out on grass in the spring. So do you specifically choose a type of cow for your region, for your land. I, I'm assuming that not all, all cows can thrive in all conditions, or am I incorrect? On You're that? absolutely correct. Mm. So if you look at the US, it's, it's actually a really weird dividing line. If you look at the map, um, Interstate 70, which runs mm -hmm. right across the middle of Colorado, is kind of a weird dividing line for breeds in the US. Mm. northern to southern climates um, so above i-70 you will see a lot more english and continental breeds angus you know your more traditional beef breeds yep. angus simmental charlay hereford any cross of all of those and that's more the beef breeds that's canada all the way down to i-70 um, and they're typically going to be heavier muscled 
hardier, thicker skinned cattle that are going to do well in winter. Mm -hmm. um, however, when you get into summer, that's why they're so far north. If they were to live in a Texas summer, mm -hmm. it's a bad deal. Um, they can really struggle, especially Angus. You know, Angus are black hided typically. Uh, yeah. There is a red Angus breed, so they're a little more liver colored. Um, but you can imagine black hided animals in yep. North Texas when it's 110 aren't great. But even if you get to some of the feed yards in Iowa or out in the Midwest near where you're at, mm -hmm. in the summer when it's really hot and humid, they'll have misters and fans um, taking care of some of those beef cattle because when they do get that big and they are getting closer to harvest, um, any additional stress on their system just isn't great. So when we talk back to cattle handling, you know, cattle facilities are also a big part of that. Mm -hmm. So for it's, us, yeah. um, for Colorado craft beef, we are Angus based. And the reason for that is we don't want calves to get too big. Um, so the Angus breed is naturally a little smaller mm -hmm. uh, compared to like Charlay or some of those other breeds, they can get a lot bigger. Uh, so for us, we want a certain size steak that fits in a certain size box that we've optimized our shipping with. Um, but also we don't want them to get too big because they can be wasty. Um, they won't yield as well. And also it's harder to keep them in a harvest window or stretch them out a little bit based on what we need. Um, and also for us at the ranch, uh, everything we're trying to do here is to, especially on the commercial side, um, get pounds a day gain on cattle that are on grass that are gonna then go be part of the beef system. Um, we want them to yield correctly. We want them to um, work correctly on grass if that makes sense. So they mm -hmm. need to have natural resistance to foot issues. Um, if they're a beef breed, they're gonna have a little thicker skin. So they're less susceptible. We do have cactus here at the ranch. Believe it or not, there is cactus in Colorado. Um, so there's a lot of different things that come into play for health, wellness, production, economics, and also what it, what does your market desire? If you're going to sell those cattle commercially, there's certain types of cattle that are better up here. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We have this amazing farmer's market in Chicago every summer, mm -hmm. and there's probably like three um, meat suppliers that come in from mostly Wisconsin and Indiana. And so I was testing all of their um, I'm a ribeye girl. So I was testing ribeyes thinking, all right, I might buy a quarter cow to, you know, save on money, get all these different cuts and stock up for the summer. And so I tried a couple ribeyes from each of the three suppliers and I did not like the taste. And so I was thinking, I wonder if the type of grass they're eating produces different flavors and textures. Can you speak to that? And were they all grass finished? All of them. Okay. So what? And, I, and I know, and I know, we're going to talk about grass fed versus mm -hmm. grain fed, but just to talk about the 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 eating. Yep. So what color was the fat on those steaks before they cooked it? It was not as yellow as I would have thought it would have been. Okay. So they maybe had some sort of concentrate. So if you see a truly grass finished animal, mm -hmm. that's going to be a a yellowish fat. And that yellow is actually beta carotene. Mm -hmm. And that beta carotene is, is soluble in that fat. That's why it's got the yellow taste or the yellow flavor. When you see like our beef, we call it craft finished because we do a mixture of grass finished concentrates and things of that nature. And of course we get into all that later. Yeah. But when the fat is bright white, like your shirt, mm -hmm. all the beta carotene has been flushed out of the fat. So when people say, oh, we like a naturally buttery flavor in the U.S., which is from the fat, that's true, but it's really not the buttery flavor we like. It's the lack of beta carotene that we're not tasting in the fat. So that's the flavor characteristic difference you get. Um, and there are some folks, um, there was, a, I got a phone call. This is a really weird story. I got a phone call from somewhere in Wyoming last fall. And I answered the phone and I talked to this nice lady and she was very sweet. And she said, hey, my beef tastes funny. And I asked her, I said, well, are you in such and such town in Wyoming? She said, yes. I said, I don't believe we've ever shipped beef there. Um, you know, do you have a phone number from a different area? She said, mm -hmm. oh no, it's not your beef I'm asking about. Well, now I was really confused, uh, but she was recommended to us from one of mm -hmm. our customers that she knew through Facebook. And she asked the same question. I got this beef. It was supposedly grain finished and 
my dad can't cook it in the crock pot because it stinks up his house. And the fat was white-ish, but then she had mentioned that it was finished on grain for six weeks, 42 days, which is about half the commercial time that something would have been finished. So that flavor profile takes a long time to come out of there. And it's basically done with concentrates that eliminate some of that grass, some of that grass flavor. Because cattle, as you know, are a ruminant animal. Mm -hmm. So from a health standpoint, they basically have their own biodigester in there that's converting grass and other stuff into protein. So depending on the level of concentrates in that ration, it will hold different stuff in the fat. And that's what changes the flavor profile. Yeah. And I, I'm all about the fat and I did not enjoy the eating the fat on this, but it was also the meat that just did not have, it had almost no flavor to it. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if that was a result of where probably the, the biggest reason for the flavor in the meat being a little different or non-existent is a lack of aging because mm. grass finished animals don't have a fat cap, which means you can't age them as long which means those natural enzymes don't break down all the other stuff inside their mm -hmm. meat tissue. Um, so that's I mean, our beef at Colorado Craft Beef is aged 21 days as a whole carcass before it's processed into steaks. Mm. Uh, and that's where a lot of our flavor comes from. Um, Dr. Baker with Meterex, you know, he's, he's told me, he's like, I can taste the difference in your stuff. Uh, and some of it comes from that. So if you're having a flavor, a flavor oddity in the fat, it's usually beta carotene from grass. If you're having a flavor oddity in the meat, it usually has something to do with the cooling and or aging process or lack thereof. It makes a lot of sense because when I go to my favorite butcher in Chicago and it is not grass fed, grass finished, it's just aged really well. It is mm -hmm. the most delicious melt in your mouth steak you can ever have. It's just so, it's amazing. So um, the only tragedy is you haven't tried our beef yet. Yes, so and I'm absolutely- <laughs> I'm absolutely going to, for sure. Walk us through the life cycle of a cattle. I know you just do yearlings, but can you take us from beginning, from birth to harvesting, what that yeah. looks like? Can do. So, and we're going to do a typical beef cow, just to keep yes. it really simple. Yep. The typical beef steer. Um, they start as a bull calf when they're born. They're going to weigh between 80 and 110 pounds, give or take. So uh, they're going to be within the first couple of days, they're going to get colostrum from their mother, you know, mammalian bioscience, just like we do now. They're going to get ear tagged typically so that they know which cow goes with which calf. Uh, and then they're going to be given a set of vitamins, you know, usually injected with some extra vitamins or something like that when they're very young, um, just to help get them up especially in our neck of the woods, um, a lot of the farmers, which are cow-calf operators, um, they calve in February and March. So if there's a storm coming or a storm just came through, there's a lot of different things that can be done. Um, then usually, you know, April, May timeframe, uh, you're going to have a branding. And that's required by the state because cattle have to be branded to prove ownership. That's very, very standard across most of the U.S., and that bull calf is going to be castrated at that time. He's going to be branded and he's going to be given his first round of vaccinations. And then about four months later, they will come off the cow. They'll get their next round of vaccination somewhere in the middle there. Usually it's 21 to 25 days later. Don't hold me to that. My wife is the cattle manager, so I could be off. She, she might send me an email later with some links <laughs> so that right. next time I talk about it, I'm more accurate. Uh, then the calves will be removed from the mother somewhere between six to seven months of age. And then they'll be weaned, which usually takes 30 to 45 days. And that's a light transition from, and mind you, they've been on pasture this whole time. That's a very important part of this. They've been on pasture this whole time. One, it's better for them. They learn to eat. But secondarily, from a viral load standpoint, they're in big open areas. So if there's any sort of sickness, it's not concentrated. It's very good for the calves to operate like this. And this is pretty standard across the beef chain, you know, nationwide, Canada, and most other places. Um, when we wean them, they'll spend 30 to 45 days, usually with a confined feeding option. So they'll usually be given a hay ration that gives them just some hay, you know, a millet hay or an oat hay, something that gives them, we call it scratch factor. 
And it's basically something that has a little rough texture to it to keep their gut working. Mm -hmm. So as to get that rumen kick started because it's used to just milk or right. some light grass. And then typically when they're weaned, um, especially here, we have a weaning pasture. So they come in once a day, they eat this, and then they can go out on you know a few hundred acres again to decrease viral load. Uh, for the next, until the 45 days is up, then depending on the weather, they can stay out on pasture, but when the weather turns, they have to go into some sort of confined feeding uh, because the pasture won't take them all year and we're trying to let the pasture regenerate and they'll come in, but also they come in because say a winter storm blows in, that if it's blowing 40 miles an hour and snowing, it'll actually push cattle through fences. Um, but I but I thought by the time you get them as yearlings, it's more like April, May. That's when we turn them out. So my wife and I on Colorado Craft Beef, we don't get our cattle till January, February. And we get oh, them straight okay. and they go straight out on grass. Got it. So depending on what time of year you get them, because some mm -hmm. people wean as early as October, some people wean as late as March. Or okay. some cow-calf operators will wean at their own place and keep them until March and then deliver and you just turn them straight out on grass. So again, all these things are super variable based on right. where you are and the timing. Um, so they may go into feeding, like say they get weaned in October, they'll go into feeding for a couple months just to have a good steady ration. They're monitored every day to make sure their health is good, et cetera, et cetera. They're kept out of the elements. Usually they have some sort of barn to get into, uh, things of that nature. And then uh, from there, at our place and places around us, mm -hmm. typically they'll be turned out. April 15th is our target date. Mm -hmm. They'll be turned out um, usually about 90 animals per square mile. So not a very high concentration, very, very light concentration. Uh, you go out and gather a square mile, it takes six or seven people on horses, and you'll still ride six miles, even though it's only a mile each direction. So is that is that a regulation, 90? Um, no. No, no, it's that's just... all. It's based on your forage rates. Um, you know, what type of soil do you have? What type mm -hmm. of grass is there? How much is there to eat? Because what we want to do is we want them to naturally graze down the grass in such a way that the grass can regenerate, but we don't destroy the root zone because the root zone, if it's destroyed, doesn't allow more grass. So it's a range management number typically. Um, if you're going and, and I'll talk about, I think one of your questions is on pasture rotation. So we'll, we'll talk about that as a kind of a separate sidebar. Okay. Because there's a lot of different things with, that go on with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so with us in particular, cattle go out like the 15th of April. Mm -hmm. And then depending on rainfall, uh, we've shipped as, we've removed cattle from grass as early as July 4th. We've went taken, taken them off grass as late as October 1st. And that is all subject to the amount of rain we have and the natural forages. So it's range management. You know, we don't want things to get eaten down too far. Um, I'll actually, we'll be sharing a really cool picture on Instagram in the next few days. Uh, we had a grass fire just a few weeks ago uh, where maybe a cigarette butt blew out of a pickup or who knows. Uh, we have a main highway that runs through the ranch and it lit the ditch on fire. Mm. It burned right up to the cattle pasture and stopped. It stopped at the fence line because of wow. natural fire breaks and things like that. So that's something else to think about from a sustainability factor, mm -hmm. um, where if it was a weaning pasture that was right next to it that hasn't been grazed all year for saving it for the fall, it would have kept going. Uh, so there's watch for that on Instagram. It's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. You'd think we drew a line right there because it stopped naturally at the fence. Um, so we come off grass when we have to, as dictated by Mother Nature. And then commercially speaking, um, those cattle are then sold into the feed yard sector. Um, they move off or they just go into a feed yard and we choose to feed them as a family ranch for whatever economic reason. Uh, for Colorado craft beef, they have to do the same thing. They have to go into confinement. Um, where we do feed um, for Colorado craft beef is a the same operation doing the rations we want um, based on my wife's huge background in cattle nutrition. Uh, my wife actually has a master's degree in cattle nutrition. Mm. So where everybody calls me a ranching expert, uh, I'm just parroting all the things I hear from everybody else. <laughs> well, so you do an excellent job delivering the information. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so what's interesting with the craft beef operation is 
we, uh, of course, dictate what they're going to eat. We dictate health protocols when they're born at the cow-calf operation. So we, we dictate everything all the way through. And that's why we called it craft beef. Um, we aren't taking cattle as they come. We aren't feeding whatever we have to. We are very, very deliberate in all of our steps through the process. Uh, we minimize corn where we can in a feed ration. Um, we feed some local byproducts based on what I can find it with through my network. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the cool things we feed within the craft beef cattle is uh, malted barley rootlets is the technical term. Mm -hmm. So how they make beer, they malt barley and there's a whole process to that, but they kiln the barley at the very end and there's little sprouts on it. And then they run it through a machine that actually knocks all the sprouts and everything and pulverizes the undersized barley Mm. But it's all been cooked and sprouted. So it's technically a sprouted seed, which makes it a grass finished ingredient. Uh, it's 27% protein. It's been sterilized because it was cooked. Uh, that's one of our main ingredients in our finish ration. And it's been awesome to watch it, um, watch it work and watch the different things that it can do. So if we, and then those cattle will go to a feed yard. Now we're back to the commercial side, not the Colorado craft beef side. So they come off grass, they go into a commercial feed yard. And how They're old are they at that point? Typically a year to, well, a year is probably light. So these calves have been born in March. Mm -hmm. They go out on pasture the following April. So they're over a year at that point. And then say right now they're 15 months old. Okay. And they're eight to 900 pounds. Okay. And then the cattle will go into a commercial feed yard and mind you, all these feed yards are regulated for water quality. They're regulated for space of cattle. So there, there's metrics they have to meet from USDA that you can't over confine, you can't underfeed. It's all very heavily regulated. So the one thing I will say, we at Craft Beef support all the sides of agriculture and we don't talk negatively about another side. Um, what we do is a little different. And I think what we do is different for a reason and we create a little different quality product. But what the rest of the sector does, they can't do at the scale we do because they're doing obviously a lot more. Um, so in a commercial feed yard, they're gonna be in there for 90 to 120 days, and then they're gonna be moved out and turned into steak. And those harvest facilities are doing an amazing job with lack of labor. Um, the national cattle supply chain harvests 660,000 cattle a week. Wow. So, uh, you know, Colorado craft beef is <laughs> not even really on the radar with any of that. Um, so when you start thinking about how do we optimize everything, well, when you're harvesting that amount of animals, there has to be some scale of economy. Right. Uh, that's the hard part with the commercial chain. When somebody says we have to change this, I'm like, I get what you're saying. And there are some things that probably are not ideal, but if we're going to feed everybody, what are we going to do? Right. Um, you know, 660,000 animals every six days because they don't process on Sundays uh, is unbelievable. It I is mean, unbelievable. Yeah. And that's the, and that's, I believe that's North America. So that's mm -hmm. US and Canada, I believe. I'd have to double check that. Um, Colorado craft beef, though, uh, we harvest, uh, I don't want to share the exact numbers, but we're, we're not into four digits. Um, mm -hmm. Everything we do comes from us directly. Um, everything that goes on to feed comes from us directly. Uh, we don't buy cattle and then just put them in a box. Um, so everything, you know, we have handled through the entire process, obviously not the cow calf sector because we don't do that. Right. Um, but everything past that is us. Um, so, so when you send your cattle to the feedlot, to the finishing mm -hmm. production facility, are they kept separate from other people's steer and do you tell them how you want them to be finished yes yes and yes got it okay i mean the facility we go to is very very small uh, the guy that owns it and they have a guy that owns it and then a guy that operates it and both of them are my cell phone uh, we see the cattle weekly uh, they are in their own facility they eat the rations we dictate mm. um, it is all our control because so many people have this image 
as I'm sure you know, this visual in our heads of these, you know, concentrated animal feeding um, operations, right? Mm -hmm. And just the horror, the horror stories that we hear from the media that mm -hmm. leaks out. And it just doesn't sound like it really is that way. It's really not. So the, the feed yard industry has really only existed since the 60s or the 70s. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, before that, we didn't feed corn or concentrates to cattle. I, I didn't know that until Kara told me. Like I said, I parrot this stuff really well, but it's not my, not my wheelhouse, or it wasn't. I guess it is kind of now. Um, but what we're doing as a, cattle op, as a cattle industry is producing the highest quality meat we can as quickly as we can for the lowest price possible. That's the biggest part to understand here because a lot of people are going to complain that steak is too expensive. Mm -hmm. But anything that is done to change the existing system is going to increase the price a lot. Um, for instance, if, uh, I know that Colorado Craft Beef, who I set the pricing for, I've got the spreadsheets on the same computer we're talking on right now. We are more than the commercial market because of the things we do that are genuinely just less efficient because we don't use some of the things that are available in the commercial market. We don't feed them as quickly as the commercial market because we want them to not you know, have any sort of stress. So that changes the economics of the product you're getting. Um, so we hear from people weekly that say, your product is too expensive. Okay, no problem. Um, the national beef supply chain, what you can buy at any grocery store in this country is safe. There's nothing wrong with it. It's grown a little differently. Probably the biggest difference is it's not aged. I mean, it doesn't have antibiotics in it. Anybody that labels a product and says antibiotic free, well, that's a mislabel because it's all antibiotic free. It's all tested. So it's one of those things that I wish, and I know we'll talk about labels later. Yeah. The truth in labeling confuses people to a level that it actually demonizes a lot of the supply chains, whether it's corn or cows or pineapples or whatever it may be. And it, the truth and labeling and the confusion behind that really just upsets the apple cart and creates a ton of issues that didn't exist in the first place, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally so, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, have you seen um, tomatoes? You ever seen a non-GMO label on a tomato? Non-GMO versus uh -huh. like an organic label? Yeah, just a non-GMO. If it says GMO free on the tomato, no. I'll bet if you go to the grocery store and you look, you will find a tomato that says GMO free. Well, all tomatoes. Are I don't. GMO I don't. Free. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen GMO free. I've seen organic. Yeah. Well, and those are two different labels. Right. But you will find you will find stuff that says non-GMO on products that yes. don't have a GMO. Right. That, that is so right. bananas to me. You know. Yes. So, non-gmo wheat i'm like well there's no approved gmo wheat it doesn't exist right and some of the some of that confusion is just doing that it's confusing the market it's giving the consumers pause because they're like oh my goodness is this bad is this good we don't really know and all that stuff just the truth and labeling stuff drives me crazy personally <laughs> it's very stressful for consumers right now right very consumers. Before we move on to that, though, I wanted to ask you when the cows, when when the cattle has to come indoors due to inclement weather, mm -hmm. do they need to be um, supplemented with like vitamin D since now they're not getting that sunshine? Are they like not, humans like that? Not usually, because remember, they synthesize all their own amino acids. They synthesize mm -hmm. all that in their rumen. Right. They have a significantly different digestive system than we do. They synthesize everything they need through their own digestive process. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the one, that's the hard part. Now cows, or excuse me, pigs and chickens, they need all those extra vitamins because they have a simple digestive system similar to us. Uh, but cows, goats, deer, elk, they all have a ruminant digestive system where they're able to synthesize all that stuff they need as long as they're getting adequate feed. Right, right. All so, right, well, let's, let's talk about um, the labels because that's going to be also a great way to incorporate 
antibiotics and hormones, preservatives and additives. And but before we jump to that, did you yeah. want to talk pasture rotation? Because I did. Yes. Walk yes. Over that. Yes. Okay. So, so when you were talking about that, in my mind, that sounds like regenerative grazing. Is that this? Is that what we're going to be talking about? Kind of. That technique. So, define regenerative. Oh gosh. <laughs> okay. That's the hard part. Well, but regenerative. Me, for go ahead. So to me, regenerative grazing means a crop rotation. So the cattle feed off of one piece of land. And then when it's down to the nub, they move to another. And that land that they had just came from gets time to rest and regrow. Perfect. Great, great definition. Okay, good. So, but, but what you notice is you didn't put a timeline on it, mm. right? Because that timeline for down to the nub, which is a good term, how far down did we get it? And honestly, if we took foraging down to the nub, we went too far. Mm. Um, I mean, if I can see the dirt, that's a bad thing, okay. especially where I live. So if we talk pasture rotation and or crop rotation, so we're going to talk ranching and farming in the same thought mm -hmm. process. Okay. What we're going to talk about is just rotating the work that that land is doing. So where I live, we've already talked, we have sandy soils. We put a small amount of cattle on a very big amount of land and we leave them there for about four or five months at the very best. And we pull them off until the following year. So that is regenerative. We are, we're able to do that. Now you will see another type of grazing referred to that's high intensity regenerative grazing. That is, I mean, there's people doing that hundred miles from here. Uh, and that is, they will take a larger number of cattle on a smaller amount of ground because their ground is really hard. They've got, you know, a root zone that's two feet deep mm -hmm. and they will graze that thing down over, you know, the course of four or five days and then move them. Mm. That is also regenerative grazing because they let that land come back. Right. And that is the status quo for 95% of all forage, all forage operations, whether it's goats in Nevada or cows in Montana, that's what everybody's doing to some degree because we have to let the land rest. What's interesting though, is some of like the high intensity grazing is relatively new uh, because it is much more labor intensive because you're having a smaller amount of cattle on a smaller piece of land and you move them every four days. Mm. Um, they're doing that a lot in Florida and Georgia, where they have soil that will take that. So pasture rotation is very critical, but it's also very regionally specific based on what your ground will tolerate, what your, you know, what mother nature offers. Uh, we haven't had a lot of rain here at the ranch this summer. So if we were doing high intensity rotational grazing, we'd be mm -hmm. out of grass by now. Mm. Uh, not to mention, we would have just hammered our sandy soil and we would be contending with dry, over depleted ground and it would actually probably cause more damage. So pasture rotation is very, very common, uh, used almost everywhere, but everybody can do it, a little, not ever. People do it a lot differently based on their region, based on their soil type, based on what mother nature provides, etc. Farming is much the same. Farming, however, has just in the last you know, few decades, they've put in strip till, they put in no till. So they're minimizing the amount of carbon that they're causing issues with. They're not opening up the ground. Uh, they're doing a lot of different things to maintain soil profiles. Mm -hmm. And then they're rotating crops based on what they need. So um, that's also a big part of how ag is changing. Um, actually, one of the it was two years ago, we bought a bunch of cattle feed for craft beef from a gentleman just 20 miles from here. And he intercropped flax seed and garbanzo beans because the flax seed uh, naturally produces, and I could be totally butchering this. Sorry, Roy, if I'm butchering it. Uh, <laughs> the flax seed produces a, a type of acid in the soil that keeps the garbanzo bean from developing a fungus that naturally kills it when it gets too big. It's very weird. I'd never heard of this before. And then he had to get a special header to harvest it correctly or harvest it at the same time because it was basically, you know, this far apart, garbanzo beans, flaxseed all the way across this field. Uh, and that kind of stuff is going everywhere. Um, I saw a, a research paper from the University of Nebraska a couple of years ago 
that was they were trying to combine oats and peas in the same rotation to get the best amount of cover crop usage in the winter mm. uh, so that they can regenerate a crop over the winter time, use it for grazing, get natural fertilizer, and then replant in the spring with a different crop. So all that stuff is front and center and everybody's looking into it uh, for the most part in all of agriculture to protect the soil because, you know, at the end of the day, we are cattle ranchers, but we cannot be cattle ranchers without the real estate. Right. So, and the farmers cannot be farmers without good soil profiles. Um, so the one thing I would, I, I think there's a lot of people, I think there's a narrative that farmers and ranchers are, you know, raping and pillaging the earth to get whatever they can. Man, that is not the case. Uh, my, my house is a hundred feet from the building I'm sitting in. Uh, and in that house is my 21 month old daughter and my well, she's 15 days old right now. We had a, had a daughter just a couple weeks ago. The ground I'm sitting on has to be here for them. Absolutely. And, and that is a, that is, I mean, this ranch is going to be six generations when they come or when we take it over. Right. Uh, it, we aren't here trying to do that. So rotation is a great thing to talk about because it's what allows it to continue. And also what they're, what you're referring to and they're planting the, um, the chickpea and what was the, the flaxseed, does that also help the flavor profile and the finished product? I'm it assuming. Can. Yeah. Yeah. So the flax, the flaxseed, especially because it's got a higher oil profile. Mm -hmm. So the concentrate level is a little higher, right. um, a little more digestible, uh, things of that nature. But as compared to like a pig, you know, if you eat a, a hog, that I was listening to Joe Rogan's podcast a couple of weeks ago and he had a gentleman on there talking about wild hogs. Mm -hmm. And he talked about the flavor difference of a wild hog in West Texas versus a wild hog in South Texas, where the one in West Texas was eating wheat and barley and the one in South Texas was eating acorns, which of course are full of fat. Mm -hmm. He said, you can tell the flavor difference for sure. Well, yeah. that's a simple uh, digestive system. What you eat goes into the meat, no problem. In the cattle, it does that, but it's much lesser. It's a much lesser degree because they do ferment in the rumen, right. extract the proteins they need. So it's not as simple of a pipeline. And then rotating the crops also helps bring carbon back into the soil. So when you're talking about these sustainable practices to keep the soil healthy, is that what you're also referring to? Yes. The carbon and footprint. Yeah. And there's a lot to be said for the farming practices, just strip tilling and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually some uh, really great data out there right now that if you're using all the agricultural best practices that exist today, strip tilling, minimum fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera, growing corn. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, one of my former classmates at Colorado State is the executive director of the Colorado Corn Council. Mm -hmm. He and I spoke this morning to make sure I was properly sharing data. Uh, he said that corn farmers today, if they are properly properly utilizing um, all the tools at their disposal, are approaching carbon footprint neutral on corn production. That's amazing. I was on uh, the White Oak Pastures site a couple days ago, reading uh, a report. Of course, I don't understand a lot of the report because it's you know written in a way that most laymen wouldn't understand. But I did understand looking at the charts and mm -hmm. the carbon footprint and, um, you know, cattle raising lends people to think that that is the biggest cause of carbon emissions. And when you look at this chart, you realize it's just not the case when no, it's like 3%. <laughs> yes, yes. And then I, I, I want to talk about the faux meat industry out there now, but um, it certainly is not as heavy duty as producing the faux meat industry, like the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat. Correct. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting to note. Mm -hmm. um, can we move on to the yeah. labeling? Are we good with that? Thank you so Happy much you. for explaining all that. This is so incredibly interesting to me. I know my listeners are going to just love all of this information. And I've got time outside the window if we need to go a little longer. Oh, perfect. Uh, no okay. problem at all. 
Great, thank you. So I'm a functional medicine health coach and I follow many functional medicine doctors and practitioners and all of them are really advising their clients to stay focused on eating very clean sources of protein. So I have a whole list here of different marketing terms that uh, organic, natural, naturally raised, antibiotic free, hormone free, grain free, grain fed, grass fed, grass finished. It's just super confusing. And we're all under the impression that the best is grass fed and grass finished. I, for one, prefer the taste of grain finished, mm -hmm. um, but I ethically prefer to purchase grass fed and grass finished. So two different things going on here. So can you break down the labels and talk about all of the, um, the different medicines you need to give to the cattle mm -hmm. under certain situations to keep them healthy? Sure. So the first thing I'll point out is, uh, we'll just go down through the list here. So you okay. mentioned organic. Yes. Organic is, well, before we get into any labels, all label claims on meat meaning it's on the label, mm -hmm. must be approved by USDA. Mm -hmm. So that's the first and foremost. If it's on the label, USDA has reviewed the label to say, yes, you have a practice that qualifies you to say that. And organic and some of these other ones are all third-party verified. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay to be in a system with IMI or some other third-party verifier yeah. to say, yes, we are truly organic. Yes, we are this. Yes, we are that. Um, you've heard about the Colorado craft beef value chain for me to be certified organic would cost me about $7,500 a year. So, Oh, just to get that certifying agency to come out and certify you. Yeah. And they do an annual audit and that's yep. not counting my time. That's the, the purchase price to them to get certified. Yeah. So when you see organic and it's a quote unquote small producer, I would say, take a look at that, especially in the meat side, because for me to be organic, I have to feed organic feed, which is crazy expensive and yeah. almost impossible to find. Um, you have to be certified. There's a ton of barriers to entry. We are not certified organic. We probably could be uh, other than the feed. I don't know where we would find enough organic feed, but typically the people that can get the organic label and be in a grocery store are usually very, very large players. So first and foremost, understand what you're buying. And if you're just buying a label, um, that might not always mean what you think. So that's how I'll start that off. Um, this is all a monetized system. You have to pay to play. It's all yeah. very, very uh, convoluted. And much like anything, you can be certified for something and maybe it is or isn't true. Who knows? Uh, organic could mean any number of things. Typically organic means no pesticides, no herbicides. Um, in the beef side, it basically means they were fed, they were raised on organic pastures and fed organic feed and not treated with anything that labeled as organic. And does, but, that, does that start with the mama cow? Oh yeah, it goes all the way back. Okay. So now the cow calf operator has to be certified, the stalker operator, the feed yard facility, not me being the owner, the facility has to be certified. And then if you go all the way over into the grain space, if you're going to be organic in flour, now you're talking the ground has to be certified, the farmer has to be certified, the mill where it's ground has to be certified. I mean, you're talking huge layers of red tape just to get there. Yes. Um, on the produce side, it's a lot faster. If you notice, if you go to the grocery store, it's almost impossible to find non-organic lettuce. Why is that? Well, lettuce has a 21 day turnaround. It's all grown in, it's all grown in greenhouses in 21 days. It's really easy to be organic in 21 days. Mm -hmm. um, so organic is all uh, dependent on the vertical you're in. Are you producing garbanzo beans? Are you producing beef? What are you producing? And they all have their own labels for that. Mm -hmm. Much of these state or much of these labels are similar to that. There's a bunch of different labels for every different industry. Yeah. Okay. So natural typically, typically would mean, um, actually, let me, I want to say this is the one that was, yeah, I think this is the funny one. Uh, USDA 
Don't mind me looking up, I'm looking at another monitor. So the natural label on beef, if you read one that says natural beef, mm -hmm. understand that beef is a different commodity than cattle. Natural cows don't necessarily mean it's natural beef. Do you see a sign that says, or a label that says natural beef? Mm -hmm. That means a whole, or a whole muscle cut, no preservative, or minimally processed, no preservatives. It means nothing about antibiotics means nothing about hormones, means nothing about anything else. If something is neighbor, labeled natural beef, it's minim, minimally processed, no artificial ingredients. What does minimally processed mean? I mean, I'm thinking ah, the word processed. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking processed means harvested. Yeah. So, how, I mean, if it's harvested, how is that minimal? Well, what I would assume it means, because I've not dug into this because it just annoys me, mm -hmm. um, minimally processed means it wasn't smoked it wasn't irradiated it wasn't there was oh, no okay. further processing it's still a whole muscle cut or whole muscle with no artificial ingredients got it now there's a ton of people though that say natural means no antibiotics no hormones no this no that not necessarily now if you look at the next one on your list naturally raised mm -hmm. that very well could mean no hormones, no antibiotics, but it depends on the certifying agency of what their definition is. Because there's multiple certifying agency. You could say, I have a naturally, I've naturally raised pork certified by XYZ certifier, and this is the definition. And people have access to see the definition. Okay, no problem. You can have that label. It doesn't all mean the same. That's the hard part is when you say, yeah. what does this mean? It's very odd. I don't know what it means because we have to figure out who certified them, who did this, who approved it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, thought you, I thought you said earlier, unless I misunderstood, that all cattle, oh no, they're vaccinated, not necessarily having antibiotics. Correct. Vaccinations yeah. are not considered treatments. Got it. Okay. So, and, and again, that depends on who you're talking to, mm -hmm. but standard cattle operations, vaccinations, um, vitamins and things of that nature are not considered a treatment mm -hmm. until you get into ionophores, antibiotics, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, everything's still okay. Got it. Um, antibiotic free. Um, mm -hmm. That label is one of the ones that bothers me because if you're eating meat in a store, it's got no antibiotics in it. Never. It's, it's been in, well. It could have been injected. It could have been treated long, long ago but all the antibiotics have a withdrawal period of X amount of days, X amount of weeks, and then the animal can still be harvested. Hmm. But antibiotic free is saying it has no antibiotics, but that's all meat because all meat is outside that window. It's all certified through USDA as being free of antibiotics. Now, if we say never treated with antibiotics, that's a totally different side. So to clarify, all meat in the store is free of antibiotics. If it has been treated with antibiotics, there should be um, like never ever is one of the labels, never ever, which is uh, no hormones, no antibiotics ever, mm -hmm. an added hormones actually. Uh, but if an animal has been treated, um, they are outside the window when they're harvested. So all meat is antibiotic free. Now the question does become, were they treated um, at any time in their life? which I think is what you would expect that label to mean, right? Yeah. Were they treated at some point in their life? It should, there should be something that says they were never treated, never treated with antibiotics. Like if you look at the Colorado craft beef website, it says, if we have a sick animal, we will treat the animal and then we remove it from the craft beef program. Mm. So uh, there's a lot of um, rumors in the industry of people that have non-treated herds that they will let an animal suffer extra days so it gets better without antibiotics. And I'm just, we're, we as a company are not okay with that. Um, if an animal is sick or an animal, uh, for instance, one of the most common things we get on pasture here at the ranch is it's called foot rot. It, mm -hmm. it is certainly not foot rot, but cows have a cloven hoof and between their cloven hoof, they have a soft palate in there. And I told you, we have cactus, we have thorns, yeah. we have whatever. If they step on something and it, it gets into that, um, soft palate between their toes. It hurts. They need an antibiotic so it doesn't rupture. 
which could cause a bigger infection. So they mm -hmm. get a light dose of antibiotics to make their foot better. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but to us, it's like if their foot hurts and they're limping to the point that we can see it, we're going to treat them and then we just remove them from the program. Um, now, what I would like everybody to understand is we will make less money on that animal. Right. Of and course. we are choosing to make less money on that animal for the life or for the betterment of that critter. And then you know, what do you do with that animal? They go into the commercial chain. So yeah. they move over to another side of the ranch and they go down the commercial path, but they come out of our premium program, which people typically expect. They were never given antibiotics. They were never given growth implants, things of that nature. So, and for the record, we're not certified on that, but my phone number is on the website. If you have any questions, just give me a call. Um, so hormone free, um, that is another one that kind of annoys me because you are a health coach. There are hormones in everything. Yes. <laughs> Hormones are the transmitters of, you know, biological data. So no matter what you eat, there's hormones in it. Mm -hmm. If you eat tofu, there's hormones in it. If you eat soybeans, there's hormones in it. Yes. Every, every meat has hormones. So anything that says hormone free, that's a labeling misnomer and it drives me crazy. What they are trying to say though, is they were not treated with growth promotants during their life cycle. Um, growth promotants are a uh, they, they look almost like a tic-tac in the cattle industry. Uh, and it basically gets inserted into the ear, in the, in the skin under the ear, and it releases over time and they get bigger. It um, sounds like testosterone pellets, which men and women get when they're mm -hmm. low on testosterone. And those that is coming from yams and soy. Mm -hmm. So it's the same, it's a little pellet and it gets subcutaneously implanted under someone's you know, skin and dissolves over time. Same, same concept. Same concept. Yes. So in the cattle industry, um, in the commercial sector, that's a very common practice. Mm -hmm. uh, we know people don't want that. So for Colorado craft beef, we don't use those. But when you see a label that says hormone free, that's what they're trying to say is we didn't use growth promotants. Um, but it's a misleader because people are like, I want hormone free beef. I'm like, well, nobody makes that. <laughs> so hormone free doesn't exist. Um, grain fed, um, we can kind of toss grain fed out the window. Grain fed is a term that really doesn't have a place in the market because grain fed is implying that it was fed grain for a while and then switched to something else. And in the beef value chain, if you started on grain, it's going to continue on grain until it's done. Um, so grain fed really doesn't, doesn't mesh. For instance, uh, so if we look at grass fed as a term and I'll back up to grain fed and yeah. kind of show why those do or don't mm -hmm. work. Grass fed is grass fed and grass finished both mean that a, a cow was fed a diet that lacked grain. That's all it means. It's that simple. So if you say the animal was grass fed, it means it's doing what we have going on outside right now. The pasture is like 120 feet that way is the first set of fences. Um, they're grass fed right now. They have no, op no option of grain. They're living on a pasture, which mind you, grass fed does not mean they were pastured. It means they're eating a diet free of grain. That's all. So they're out here, they're being grass fed, no problem. And then they will go in and be grain finished. Craft finish is what we call it because we mix that different set of ingredients. Wait, so is grass fed and pasture raised different? Totally different. Totally. Because all cattle are grass fed like 85% of their life, correct? I'm glad I didn't have to say that. <laughs> so yes. I'm, I, ah, you're absolutely okay. right. Okay. Most and cattle are grass fed for the majority of their lives. Um, but there are some cattle um, that are, and mind you, when they're with their mother, when they're with the mother cow, they're technically grass fed, right? They don't have any grain, they're on the grass, they're drinking mama's milk. Mm -hmm. And some of them, depending on the time of year and the region they're in or whatever it may be, may go straight to a feed yard to be calf feds. And they'll go in, you know, 600 pounds and they will just feed them out to finish and then move them through. So some places don't have grass. Excuse me. Or if you have a big drought in your area and there's not enough pasture, sometimes those calves will go straight into a feed yard to be finished and moved into the beef, into the beef supply chain. Um, that's common-ish, mm -hmm. but 
the most economic gain you get on cattle is what ours are doing right now on pasture. So when it, when it does say pasture raised, um, that, that means they lived in a pasture. If you're buying grass finished, that does not mean they weren't in a feed yard. That does not mean they did not live in a feedlot. That does not mean any of those things. It doesn't mean they're antibiotic free. It doesn't mean they weren't given growth implants. It means they ate a diet that was free of grain. That's it. And there is some, some ambiguity in that because peas technically are a legume, not a grain, but they are 95% the feed value of corn. Mm. So it comes down to where is the line drawn by your producer or whoever it is, and how does that label affect them? What so, were they inspected for? What were they audited for? All those different things. So does pasture raised mean that the cattle was raised and finished in a pasture before it was harvested? Or did that yeah. pasture raised animal also go to a feedlot? depends on what the auditing agency defines it as. Wow, this is just super confusing. That's, that's the hard part. So uh, understanding it's so confusing, what I have said on, I don't know, six or eight podcasts already, if this stuff matters to you, mm -hmm. find a producer, mm -hmm. get them on the phone, ask them the questions that matter to you. Mm -hmm. um, actually, just before you, uh, we started the podcast, I got a text message from a gentleman that's bought some beef from us in Denver. He said, hey, I want to buy a quarter, but I want to come see the ranch. Can I come out and pick it up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem, man. Come on out. You know, if it matters to you to really understand the process, to answer all these questions, you can't really believe the labels. That's the hard part. Yeah. So you have to do your due diligence. You have to go find, if it matters. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the beef in the store. Right. It's labeled, whatever. Do what you want right. to do. Right. But if this is something that you want to make sure you're supporting an industry that does X, Y, Z or producers right. that do X, Y, Z, make sure you find them. They exist. I mean, I'm a hundred miles from Denver. I can think of six or seven producers between me and Denver that do the same thing I do. They don't have to drive all the way out here. And I know these other people allow people to come by, but at the same time, I applaud my competitors for doing good business. Yeah, You know, I can't feed all of Denver. I don't think I could feed all of my county to be totally transparent. Um, but if you really want to know what the labels mean and what the labels mean actually mean something to you, find somebody, get them to ask the, or answer the questions you want to know and don't necessarily read the labels because they don't always mean yep. what you think. I agree. You have to be your own self-advocate. It's like in the keto community. I have a lot of people that come to me and want either they're on a keto diet or they want to start a keto diet and they want like a list of keto friendly, you know, snacks and prepared foods they can eat. And all of these labels out in, you know, you go to whole foods, keto, this keto, that. And when you look at the ingredients, you realize it is not keto. Not and who, and people are just putting labels and words and marketing terms on these products. And it's very overwhelming to the consumer and a consumer who might not feel like they can be an advocate for themselves at that point, or just don't understand the, the language will just buy it. And, you know, they're spending a lot of their money on products that are not what they think they are. So well, I, they're paying a premium. That's, yes. that's probably the biggest tragedy. Yes, absolutely. Because they're paying more for something they didn't need to, right. assuming they're making a better decision or doing something better for their health. And right. they're just throwing that money away. Exactly. Yeah. But the marketing guy got paid. <laughs> yes, he did, right? The marketing guy that made the label got paid. Right, so, right, right. Uh, so, yeah. And ahead. then the last, the last uh, item you had here was grass finished. Yes. Um, so grass finished again. It just means they were fed a diet that didn't have grain. And they were finished that way. Um, the, the most egregious label claim I've ever seen was uh, one of our competitors who I won't name. Uh, I saw a picture of a steak they had and it had that super bright white fat. And they claimed to be grass finished. I was like, hmm. That's, that's curious. I start looking into it and it says on their package, grass finished has a little asterisk next to it. And down below it says grass finished the last 30 days. 
well, we've already talked, you know, a grain finished diet's like 120 days. Right. So what, what I would assume, totally my projection, they were grass finishing or grain finishing and then grass finishing the last 30 days because they wanted the grain finished flavor while selling to a grass finished market. But because they said grass finished the last 30 days, they can do whatever they want before that. And it's, right. it's ambigu ambiguity on the labeling to try to sell more product. And that is not something any, anybody in ag needs to be doing to consumers to further confuse them. How often do you think that beef products are mislabeled on purpose and not caught and make it to market? Hmm. Well, what I would say is mislabeled is probably 0% because USDA has to approve all those labels mm -hmm. and you have to back up your paperwork uh, to a very, very high degree. Mm -hmm. How many of them are labeled in a way that could be misleading? <laughs> That's a totally other question. Um, some that are, you know, intentionally labeled with some gray area probably of standard beef you're going to find in the store, not much of the premium beef that has all the fancy packaging and the extra labeling on it. I would assume, uh, especially the stuff you find in the grocery store is somewhere in the 30 to 40%. But that is assuming that people know what they're looking at on the labels. Yeah. Because I think we could both agree that the labeling system in and of itself it's kind of designed to be a little gray. Absolutely. So people are playing within the rules of the system, but that doesn't mean they're actually being truthful. And now lots of the grocery store chains have their own private labeling. Mm -hmm. So well, they're going- And most of the big packers have their own private labels that they rotate every few years because it'll come out under XYZ name. Right. And then people will over time figure out that it's owned by this very large packer that's doing their natural program under that label. Right. And then they'll shut that label down and pop up another one. Right. That's very, very common. Right. Because people think they're buying from a, from a ranch, not a big packer. The big packer learned that game a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So is conventionally raised beef is safe to eat as grass fed or better, worse, equal? What are your thoughts on that? So I'm gonna back up about 10 minutes. Remember 85% of beef is grass fed. Right. Most conventionally raised beef is grass fed. It's not labeled that way, but at some point it was right. grass fed. Right. So if we wanna change that to say grass finished, so as conventionally raised beef is safe to eat as grass finished. So if we're talking grain finished versus grass finished, Yes. Is that how you want to ask us ask the question? Yeah. Okay. Let me reword it. Is it is? Let's talk about the nutrition profiles. It is. Mm -hmm. Is it is? Is conventionally raised or grain finished beef as nutritionally dense as what people say grass fed and grass finished beef is? Because okay. there's a lot of claims out there that grass fed and grass finished beef has higher amounts of omega-3 fatty acids mm -hmm. um, that there's a lot of functional medicine doctors who will say, you are what you eat. So if you eat a cow that was grain fed or had um, hormones or antibiotics, that's all gonna go into your stomach and that's gonna disrupt your gut microbiome. And I remember a few years ago hearing a story of a truck that got into an accident and tipped over on its way to Wisconsin to a cattle rancher. Mm -hmm. And when it tipped over and fell, all these Skittles came out. And the story mm -hmm. was that these Skittles were going to be fed to the cattle in the finishing days to fatten them up with the sugar. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't want to eat a cow that's eating Skittles at the end of its life. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of go down a few different paths here. Okay. With regard to the nutritional claims, um, that is not my wheelhouse. So I'm going to paraphrase something that one of my nutritional buddies talked about. Okay. Uh, Danny, Danny Vega. I'm not yep. sure. If you, okay. Yes, of course. So I was on Danny's podcast last, last year and Danny and I talked about it. Then I asked him, 
hey, you're the nutrition guy. Mm -hmm. Is there really something to be said for this? And he said, it is, it is published and it is understood that there is more omegas, et cetera, the same things you mentioned in grass finished versus grain finished. Mm -hmm. But he said from a macro level and an absorption level, it's, and the percentages are so small. Yes. He said it, it is more, but it's kind of inconsequential. Yes. This is how he presented it. I could be totally paraphrasing it incorrectly, but that was his message. Um, from what I've talked to some meat science friends of ours, amino acid profiles and efficacy of vitamins and minerals, there could be a difference. But part of that, especially when you talk about uh, beef that comes from a person that ages like Colorado craft beef, mm -hmm. we age for 21 days. Mm -hmm. In that 21 days, there are enzymes breaking down tissues, breaking down collagen within the beef that makes it much, much, much more digestible. Mm -hmm. So if you think about efficacy of vitamins and things in there, what they've said is there's not enough data to say that it's good or bad one way or the other. Right. So what I have taken from the health people that I talk to, because I do not claim to be a health guy, mm -hmm. I have hated science since forever. I would rather build a spreadsheet. That is my game. Mm -hmm. Um while there could be some benefit, it seems to be minimal. It is, is minimal and you're correct. And I knew the answer. I okay. just wanted to get another perspective from you. And I'm glad that you brought all of that up because it is true. In fact, um, if you eat a finger size serving of wild caught salmon, that's going to blow the omega-3 fatty acid profile of beef. Uh, it's uh, out of the water. It's, it's so much more. Well, and it, it, my wife, my wife, the scientist and I were going through your questions this morning to make sure uh -huh. that I wasn't way out of my realm here. Yeah. And her comment was, if you want omegas, eat fish. Exactly. Eat, so. eat salmon roe, eat wild caught salmon, sardines, oysters, clam, all of that. But, um, you know, a lot of people get stuck on this concept of grass fed, grass finished. I was, I know when I started really honing in on my carnivore, I absolutely wanted the, what I thought was the highest quality, cleanest product out there, grass fed and grass finished. Mm -hmm. um, but I've decided that for me, I think it's more of an ethical, um, there's more of an ethical component to that for me than so the, the you nutrition. wouldn't mind it. I'd love to peel that back though, to understand why ethical, you know, what is making it ethical to you. And then maybe we can just talk through some of that um, because that's really my background was knowing that. Yeah, so what ethically drives you towards grass finish? I, I think about the environmental impact of um, grass fed and grass finished cattle. But now yeah. listening to you and seeing the chain of events that happens to bring it that cattle to the point of being harvested. So I guess I'm really more about pastured. Mm -hmm. I like the pastured animals. Right. Um, because to me, I like the concept of regenerative farming, regenerative grazing, um, the importance of bringing the carbon back into the soil, having that water stored in the soil, um, and having our planet be worked on in a sustainable way. So to me, that's more the connection mm -hmm. because I actually prefer the taste of grain finished beef. Okay. So, uh, so I'll, I'll uh, give a little response. Okay. Uh, you're really concerned about regenerative ag, mm -hmm. rotational grazing. Mm -hmm. We can't rotate to benefit next year if we don't have somewhere for those cattle to go. So a confined animal feeding operation, a concentrated animal feeding operation is the best use of that. Yeah. Secondarily, from an environmental standpoint where we're at, we don't get enough rain in the fall and through the winter to sustain anything on the pasture. So the pasture is actually going to go down if we have cattle out there longer. Hmm. And then if we think about the energy requirements of cattle in the winter and how we can best give them the most ingredient or the most energy at the coldest time of year to produce more meat. Mm -hmm. Our best option for that is farming where we can then have grain, which is the most concentrated amount of energy we can have in the smallest amount of space. Mm -hmm. So we're now storing energy from the summer to use in the winter right. to make cattle bigger. 
Right. So I totally agree with everything you're saying, but what I would like to point out is we're doing the things that you're maybe ethically on the fence about just in a way that maybe isn't as pretty as cows on a pasture. Well, and, and that's exactly it, right? I, when we first started the podcast, I was talking about that vision, the vision mm -hmm. many people have about cows being just shoved, you know, on top of each other in a concentrated, um, um, in a cafe, in, in a cafe. Thank you. Yep. And that might be the case for the end where mm -hmm. they're in the feedlot but it's certainly not the case for the majority of their life. And that's all cattle. It's the majority of all cattle. Yes. So just to clarify that for the listeners. And then when we look at the CAFO, you know, concentrated animal feeding operation, yep. that applies, there's different regulations across the space, whether it's beef or dairy or chickens or pigs, that is all regulated very, very highly yep. because it could be an animal welfare issue. So um, clean bunks, water runoff um, in feed yards, um, especially on the, on the beef side. So we'll talk beef because I've been in some of the cafes for pigs and chickens, and that's a whole other, a whole yes. other ball of worms. Uh, but on the beef side, uh, they have water retention. So they have storm water retention that's on site. So there's no runoff. They capture any effluent that comes off. It's then usually turned into fertilizer and put on farm fields nearby. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of bunk space, bunk space is actually the biggest regulator in the beef, beef chain for feedlots because cattle need to be able to get up and efficiently eat. I mean, that's a, that's a huge concern because if you have too many cattle in a pen that only has X amount of linear feet of bunk space, they can't all eat at the same time. And if they can't all eat at the same time, the smaller ones are going to get pushed back. Right. That's all regulated. That is all that is all compliance regulated across the board in every state in the country. So I will freely grant that it's way more fun seeing cows on pasture. But when you see cows in a feed yard, it's not ideal, but they are taken care of. They have fresh water. They have fresh food every day. Um, when we get storm events out here, you'll see feed yards. They'll bring in straw and put out bedding for them. Mm -hmm. um, and the funny thing is, uh, if, so the pasture behind our house right here is 640 acres. If I put up a bunk line out here in that pasture and fed them a ration every day, mm -hmm. they wouldn't leave. They would stay right here, whether or not they have 600 acres to go to. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one of the things as they get bigger and they get closer to the end of their life cycle and they look to become beef. It's not that we, as an industry, look for that. It's not that we relish it, but it is the best option because if they weren't going into the protein system, mm -hmm. why would we need that many cows? Right. I mean, I, I love this discussion because at the end of the day, grass-fed and grass-finished beef is a premium product at a premium price. It's expensive. Would you like to know why? Why? because it's exceptionally inefficient to make. Right. That's because when they, right. when beef cattle get to, you know, eight or 900 pounds, they won't naturally get that much bigger. So you're going to have an animal that if you want them to get to the same natural endpoint as a grain finished steer, mm -hmm. they're going to need to be double the age. Mm. And that natural carry of that animal to get to that longer endpoint is going to be so cost prohibitive, you can't do it. So they have to harvest them earlier mm -hmm. when they're younger and they produce less meat on the same animal. Mm. So it's sheer economics that drives it. Um, so I would actually say it's probably not the premium product. Mm -hmm. I would say it's an early, it's an early, uh, it's taken early in the system. So it's got an artificially high price. If we're looking at it just from a spreadsheet standpoint. Right. And not everybody can afford that premium price. For sure. That's um, why there's a grain finished market because the, yeah. the community demands the best they, they can get for the lowest price. And so besides being a functional medicine <clears throat> health coach, I'm also a certified meat RX carnivore coach. And yeah, and I, and I love it. And I love um, helping people understand the importance of eating animal protein in their diet. 
and feeling so much better pretty quickly. And I want everybody to afford that. And mm -hmm. so talking to you and, and really understanding the process of raising the cattle and finishing the cattle and all these different labels makes me feel better at helping my clients feel that they're able to afford you know, all cuts of beef across the board and mm -hmm. make those choices that are, if, are economical to them, that make sense to them and their family. Yeah. Well, I, and the, I, yeah. the carnivore oh. side for me has been great. Um, I was actually texting with Dr. Baker a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I am I'm down. actually having him on my podcast next week. Outstanding. Yeah. I'm actually down 40 pounds. Uh, Dr. Baker challenged me to the carnivore diet. I'm not sure if you know the history behind that. Um, but Dr. Baker and I were at a keto event and he'd been doing some work with the company and I'm about as tall as Dr. Baker. He might have mm -hmm. a couple inches mm -hmm. and, uh, him, Danny Vega and Brandon Scott were at the same event. And the next morning we left and Dr. Baker and I had a great time. He was a good guy. And, uh, he challenged me on Instagram to go 90 days carnivore. Mm. And he didn't tell me he was going to do that. <laughs> it was it was very much, he put it on Instagram and my wife was like, what are you going to do? I was like, I think I kind of have to, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dr. Baker's comment at the event was, hey man, you could stand to lose some weight. You own a beef company. You have no excuse. I mean, he was respectful about it, but that was the message I got. Right. He wasn't wrong. <laughs> uh, but I've been almost exclusively carnivore since January of 2020. I'm down almost 40 pounds, I'm feeling better than I have. My goal right now is to keep losing weight so that I've always lost more weight than our daughter that was born like six weeks before that. Um, and probably the, just kind of cap the grass finish, grass fed uh, conversation. I've got some friends that are doing carnivore. They've tried the grass finish thing. And the complaint I get is, man, I still feel hungry. Because I there's, eat. there's not as much fat. Exactly. Is I can right. and they feel foggy because the fat helps your brain work. Right. They're like, I, I've eaten this and I just don't feel like I ate enough, but I can't eat anymore. And I'm like, man, that's that's a tough way to go. Yeah. So my recommendation to people on carnivore is, you know, find what works. Don't be afraid to try something else and figure out what makes you feel the best. Um, Absolutely. I, I converted a wheat farmer to being a carnivore. They farm, wow. they farm a ton of wheat in Oregon. He's a close friend of mine mm -hmm. and, and it works great because he buys beef for me. So, you know, it's, it's dual benefit, <laughs> but he harvests wheat and he tells me, he's like, man, I don't understand how people buy this stuff. And he's driving a combine, harvesting, talking to me on the phone, telling me that he's carnivore and he doesn't understand why people buy wheat. And I'm like, well, <laughs> there is that. Right. So, well, that's wonderful to hear that you feel better. And what about your wife? Does she eat? more animal-based? Uh, well, she's always been pretty much animal-based. Um, yeah. You know, being a rancher's daughter, right. uh, steak was kind of life. Uh, but I mean, as a family, we're pretty heavily carnivore. Um, Emma, our oldest daughter, I don't, it wasn't her first word, but it was in the first 10 was steak. Um, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, she, she, uh, she likes herself some steak. She doesn't really eat carbs. She'll occasionally have some. I mean, we don't go out of our way to avoid them. Yeah. Her, but we just naturally don't eat them much. Yeah. Um, what we stayed away from with her, especially with just snack food and all the garbage. Absolutely. Um, so she gets fruit and vegetables and meat. Yeah. It's and been really challenging getting my um, female clients to eat more red meat because, of course, you know, doctors are telling everybody to not eat red meat. You know, you don't want to bring in all this cholesterol, saturated fat. Well, what did they think that they were raised on when they were drinking milk out of their mother's, you know, breast? Mm -hmm. It's pure cholesterol. It's there for a reason. So probably the, the weirdest carnivore story uh, that I saw uh, with myself was I've had my commercial driver's license since I was 22. Mm -hmm. So my license to drive a semi-truck. Yep. And to have that, you have to have a physical every two years that you have to get medically certified so that you don't have a health issue and wreck and, you know, drive a 90,000 pound vehicle into, you know, a crowded mall or something. Right. Since I got my license right out of college, I have had, I've had high blood pressure at every, 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 uh, certification. I was carnivore for 70 days when I got recertified 
was the first time since I was 22 that I didn't have high blood pressure. And I was like, wow, that's a pretty crazy thing. That's amazing. Uh, Good for and you. And it's something I'd always, I'd had doctors tell me, oh, you have white coat syndrome. You know, you come to the doctor's office, you just get, you know, nervous. No, it wasn't that at all. I actually had high blood pressure because I was eating like crap. Right. <laughs> Right. It's all those um, hidden rancid seed oils and uh, sugars and all these products that people are eating that gives them heart disease and high blood pressure and metabolic dysfunction and all of that. How, speaking of the carnivore diet, have you seen a positive or negative impact on the meat industry um, when it comes to the faux meats, like the impossible burger and the beyond meat? I haven't seen anything directly. Mm -hmm. um, certainly there's people buying them and every fast food chain has, you know, their whatever yes. possible, whatever the heck. Right. Um, I think it's probably going to continue to grow similar to the almond milk and, you know, alternative milk market has. I don't know that we have a lot to worry about yet because their cost of production is way higher than ours is. Um, but probably the funniest thing was during COVID when uh, the, re the grocery stores were, you know, suffering supply chain issues. And the only thing left in the meat section of the store was all that fake stuff. I, I, I kind of laughed at those pictures. I didn't laugh because people didn't have meat. That was not cool. Right. Um, of course, through COVID with Colorado craft beef, we were as fast as we could process animals. They were going out the door. Um, you know, we had elderly people call us because they were immunocompromised and couldn't go to the grocery store. Right. And it was it was unreal. It was just as fast as we could process beef. But even seeing during a pandemic when there's literally nothing else to eat, people being like, I'm not buying that stuff made me feel pretty good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I remember my kids watched that uh, documentary uh, Game Changers and they said to me, oh, we're going to you know, buy this fake meat and we'll feel better. I said, uh, no. I am the matriarch of this family and that is definitely not happening. And they did it for about a week or two. And they're like, yeah, you're right. This tastes horrible. I don't feel, you know, it feel as good. And, you know, my boys are all like big athletic um, guys and all they want to do is continue to build more muscle. I said, you're not going to be able to do it when you eat that. So yeah, the pea protein is not going to get it done. <laughs> definitely not. So we're coming to a close and I have a couple more questions for you. What are your top three favorite cuts of beef? I mean, the ribeye has to be on the list. Of course. Naturally. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can get a ribeye cap steak, that's really the best way to go. There's not a lot of places that do that. But if you can I've find ever it, had that. I don't think I've even ever heard of that. Well, you have the natural shape of the ribeye and there's that right? piece around the corner that's always the softest part. Yeah. That's the ribeye cap. Hmm. You can get a cap steak. If you could ever find one, get it there it's okay amazing. yum um they're hard to find uh the only restaurant i've ever seen that serves them there is a chain in idaho called jakers where yeah. there's four or five more there and they do a ribeye cap steak and those are amazing yeah um and then honestly some of the more uh or some of the less known lesser known cuts are what i've kind of gravitated to because through the beef company of course people are buying stuff all the time and we end up, you know, with a surplus of X, Y, or Z product. Mm -hmm. And probably some of the lesser known cuts are the ones I've really been gravitating toward. Um, one of them is the flap steak, mm -hmm. uh, otherwise known as the bavette or the bottom sirloin. Yep. Man, you can fillet that thing out and make some of the most tender, like steak cuts, or you can do, yep. you know, like a fajita bowl with it. Uh, that's one of my go-tos. Uh, yeah, I've had that. They're very that. good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a natural texture that's just amazing. Yeah. Uh, and then probably, you know, the picanha tri-tip or a brisket, something you can smoke. Yes. Um, just because you can get that really flavorful bark. Yes. I was just away at my friend's lake house in Wisconsin and we brought up like a 10 pound bone in prime rib and mm -hmm. smoked it on the Traeger for about seven hours. It was beyond delicious. I, I think, and I, I ordered, I brought way more than we needed as a group because I wanted it for breakfast, mm -hmm. like steak bite, prime rib steak bites and grass fed butter. I had it every morning for breakfast for like four more days. It was terrific. That sounds like a good plan. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what can my listeners do today if they're new to eating beef and they want to buy the very best local option that they can? Are there resources that they can look at online if they really want to stay local? Well, I think MeterX actually has a directory, mm -hmm. don't, don't they? Yeah. So, I mean, MeterX has done a pretty good job, um, Sean Baker and people like yourself are trying to network that. Yeah. That would be where I would start um, because uh, Dr. Baker has done a great job of building a discount network, uh, yeah. getting people talking about it because the carnivore diet can be kind of daunting for people. Yes. And, and if you're new to eating beef, especially at that level, Mm -hmm. Finding other people to talk to, to learn about different recipes so you don't get bored or to find different cuts or find different ways to cook it. Um, right. That's really the best option I can think of. Uh, you can Google any number of things, depending on where you're at in the country, there's going to be people that can send stuff to you. Um, you know, just vote with your dollars. If there's a certain type of the industry you want to back up, find them. Um, you know, we at Colorado Craft Beef, we ship nationally once a week. Yep. Um, actually, next week, we are sending a box to Alaska. This is the first place I've announced it. That is now all 50 states we've shipped to. Oh, congratulations so, on that. That's wonderful. It's It's been weird. Uh, we have subscribers in Hawaii. I wasn't sure how that came about. Um, but, you know, just look around. And you yep. can, and local is good. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you like good grain finished beef and you're right. in Florida, that's going to be tough. Right. Um, you might have to. Regional. Right. You might have to be out of your region to get yeah. what you want. And um, the good news for my listeners is Jeff has offered a 5% discount through the end of September. And you're going to use code JF wellness five. And I'll put that in the show notes. And his website is Colorado craft beef.com. And I was looking at it before we jumped on the podcast and you have some really wonderful cuts of beef and gift bath, gift um, items and a really nice selection. I, I really enjoyed looking at your online store. And so um, all of this will go in the show notes, how to find Jeff. I'm going to put his number in there. If you want to talk to or a cattle rancher and you have some questions I wasn't able to answer or get to um, on this podcast, please feel free to reach out to Jeff. He was so kind um, and responsive to my initial um, request. And so Jeff, thank you again so much for all of your time and all of your energy into making this so easy to understand and um, sort of debunking a lot of the, the myths out there that we've been fed by the media. And I think it's really important. Um, and I loved hearing about your own carnivore journey too. That's also incredibly important um, to my listeners so that they can have all these different people around them who are trying it and finding success in their own way and making it um, attainable in your own lifestyle. Like you're a cattle rancher and doing carnivore successfully. And I'm a health coach in the middle of downtown Chicago doing the carnivore diet successfully. And you have to find what works for you and you have to enjoy the food you're eating. And to me, eating a ribeye steak, it, there's just nothing better. Right. Well, yeah. uh, two, just two other items. I uh -huh. think I'm going to be with Dr. Baker here in a couple of weeks. And we Great. have an original picture on Instagram from when he challenged me. So I think we're going to do it before and after. I'm going to take the same clothes I wore that day. Um, and then if somebody goes to the website and you see, a, we have some predetermined packages on there. Yep. If you mm -hmm. want something more custom, uh, just reach out through the email and we do custom options in the back. Um, we can do them directly. And then we are going to have an update to the website around October 1st. It's going to allow for custom box options. Oh, wonderful. That's great. And I'm definitely going to be ordering and trying out your beef. All right. Well, thank yeah. you very much for having me today, Joel. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. And um, good luck with your little girls. You have two girls, right? Two girls. Yeah. Yep. Good, good luck with uh, the, new, the new one as well. I, th I think we'll be all right. Thank you very yeah. much for that. Yes. All right. Well, have a great day. And um, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Lifestyle changes can be hard and overwhelming to make. By building your support team of functional medicine doctors, therapists, and health coaches, you can reach your optimal health goals. Be sure to check out my other podcasts. Until we meet again, stay healthy.